Well, hello and welcome along to another We Happy Few 506. No, I'm in. Get in. No, I'm, I'm gone. Am I in or not? I'm in. <laughs> uh, someone's treading on my lines. Uh, fortunately, is a master of the air, a man for the greatest generation and someone I cannot tell off. So, James, if you just wouldn't mind giving me 10 seconds, I'll carry on with my introduction. Um, he's thrown me slightly. So it's the We Happy Few podcast, Nearly Men. I'm here with my beautiful co-host, Doug Allen. I'm here with Bob Farmer from uh, the Living History Project Group magazine business. Uh, and we have with us uh, another master of the air. We are truly honoured to welcome James L. Hutchinson. How are you, sir? Just fine. Just fine. <laughs> how you how you handle or, or 98 98 and a half i'm just fine you look fine man you got the cheekbones of a 27 year old now this white this mini to mini recorder is still showing do i just click got it and get rid of it yeah okay that's gone okay <laughs> go, go right ahead <laughs> <laughs> so I better give you a proper introduction, James. So the L stands for Lee. It's um, such a technical. You know, I've, I've always gone by Lee. But, Do you just uh, go by Lee? When you write a book or two, you have to use your full name. Right. So how many how many books have you written? I have eight. Eight. I have six on World War Two and and two on the Greatest Generation. I did one on after I did a few war stories. I'll back off a minute. My war stories are, except for my diary, they're all short stories by different men who did the who did the fighting. Right. And okay. People I have interviewed and people I have, I got a hold of a, our our four ninetieth bomb group. All wrote stories about forty years after the war. They wrote stories about their greatest mission, and therefore I, and they were not copyrighted. They were just big loose leaf volume. And uh, they gave me permission to go right ahead and print those. And so I suddenly picked up about 200 stories. And a friend and I did a television program out of the high school here in Bedford. And uh, we interviewed all of it, all the veterans in our area, probably 50 to 60 of them, and uh, selected the ones that were good. But we'd give each guy a, a disc of his, of his program, and then we'd broadcast it on a local TV channel. So I got those. And what I end up with is about 240 different stories of guys that actually did the fighting. I put my 20 missions. I did 20 missions before I was 20. I was a radio operator gunner on a B-17. 490th Bomb Group, Squadron 848. And uh, we made lead crew after four, after four missions. We suddenly became a lead crew. And so we finished the last 14 as lead crew and, of course, the target, you know. And um, it was a lot of fun. I didn't have to fly every day. Like some of these guys, they put those crews up two or three days in a row. And that, of course, was one one day it just get, wears you down. Uh, and this photo you see on my magic ring on my finger, that's an air cadet ring. Okay. They promised us we we, we were in it. I was in the infantry, and they promised me that if I flew, if I volunteered to fly, I could be an officer and a gentleman. Hmm. Whereas I was eighteen years old and couldn't even drive a car, but I fell for it because I wanted out of the infantry, and uh, I bought the ring. And two weeks later, they plunked me out and said, "You're now a gunner." And the gunning, and so. I te we they flunked everybody out. Forty of us in the barrack. I think maybe three of them made it to the officers. They got they got to proceed. The rest of us were gunners, but I passed an aptitude test for radio, and so I got to go to radio school first. Some of the other guys passed mechanics aptitude test and got to go to be mechanics. If you didn't, if you failed those courses, you got immediate immediately you went to gunnery school. Luckily, I passed the radio test and became an op radio operator with more code and, and voice. And then I went to gunnery school. So the, the Army had a very, an excellent education program. 
They trained every one of us just to do exactly what they wanted us to do. So radio school, gunnery school, assigned to, for the first time I, I knew what I was going to fly, but they assigned it to combat group training. So it took about seven months to find out what I was going to be on. And luckily I got on a B-17 for combat crew training. Went over on the Queen Mary and ended up at, on the Brome Dome, what we called it, a little town called Bromer in, uh, in Suffolk County, Suffolk, sorry, or whatever. And uh, that was the fun part. And so I wrote, I wrote my diary and I, we would fly a mission and then I would cut out that mission from the next day's issue of Stars and Stripes. So my diary became handwritten sketches that I drew and based in pictures from the from the uh, Stars and Stripes. It was a very good way to make them. And uh, I had a heart attack and I taught school for 37 years, I have three college degrees, and um, I was teacher, principal, assistant superintendent, and back to principal. Assistant superintendent is not a good job. <laughs> and I had no no authority. I meant to ask you about this, James. I have a series of questions yeah. for you. Um, and one of my later questions is, having gone through what you went through, uh, having flown B-17s, um, did you not think you deserved peace in life? Why did you become a teacher? Why did I take pick teaching? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it started in third grade. A teachers, the teacher would let me drill the other kids, the slow learners. Started in third grade. So I went all the way through and into high school. And I always wanted to be a history. I was interested in history and I was interested in journalism. And I was interested, in, of course, in teaching. And so I got my teacher's license in secondary education. And, uh, of course, the, the war had ended. Nope, there weren't any students, really. It had that dead period during the war, you know, the four or five years. And uh, so I couldn't get a job in a high school level. So they sent me back and let me convert to elementary, which is where I belonged in the first place. Because <laughs> I love kids and I can work with people. Right. And I've done it all for 37 years. I did that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I've been retired 37 or 38 years now. So I've had all this time. But in 2000, I had a heart attack. My love has always been horses and golf. And I spent all my spare time in horses and golf. And my wife agreed with it. And that was fine. You know, no, no problem. And so when I was... D did retire. Well, that's I, I have had a very good life. No money. The education you don't count on money. No. You can count on a little combat with <clears throat> parents, kids, and that's it. <laughs> but uh, the money is not an issue. I had when I finished that nine months in combat zone in England. God had protected me, and, and I was at the point where I didn't want to be a rich man. I wanted to be a man that was happy. And that hinges back on the fact that I grew up in the Depression when we had nothing. And we lived in houses without electricity, without water, without heat or conditioning. And uh, so we were without food back for practically. The mess hall was my favorite place in the service because I had all the food I wanted. And well, so that's... Um, James, um, is there any chance that you saw my notes before this interview? Because you're literally answering all my questions without <laughs> me asking. I was going to ask about you growing up in the tail end of the Depression. Uh, like you're answering, you've got an incredible mind. It's fantastic. Can I ask you a question um, about being drafted? Were you drafted into the infantry before you uh, went into the Air Force? I, I was, they, they were taking everybody. The class I was in in 1943 graduated. I needed six credits to graduate. In those days, a high school diploma was a very important thing. And I would be the first one in my family to graduate from high school. But we were farm families, and we all quit school and went to the farm. 
right. in my case, I was living in town and I was determined to get that high school diploma. And so I needed all I needed to have one one more semester. And I thought, I'm gonna apply to stay at home one more semester. They didn't agree with that. And so I was suddenly just drafted. And um, once you are drafted, you belong to Uncle Sam and you do what Uncle Sam tells you to do. So I ended up in the infantry and um, I couldn't, I, I, I didn't want there. And so I volunteered to fly. Uh, they were losing so many planes in 43 and 42 and 43 and 44 early that they needed gunners and they needed officers. And they, 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 so they went after us. And that's why the air cadet program became so, it was within the air, air corps and it became very important because they, they had to get, they had to recruit from the service. Right. Never thought of that. I'd never considered that. I'd never considered that. They had to recruit from within the service. Yeah. Yeah. I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of thinking about this down through the years. Yeah. And, and now in this particular picture, this is our lead crew. Oh, okay. They've taken off the ball turret gunner and put on a PFF in the place of the ball. And they took off the tail gunner and put the co-pilot back there because we were lead crew and he was fire control officer to make sure the rest of the plane stayed in formation, stayed tight and keep the fighters out. For those and, people who don't know, James, what, what does, what does lead crew mean? Okay. You had, you flew with 12 planes here, 12 planes here and 12 planes over here. Okay. So we could all bomb at the same time, but each squadron of 12 had the lead crew. So we had command pilot, Command bombardier, command navigator, added to this, added to the crew. They didn't want their picture taken necessarily because they really weren't crew members, you know. They were the majors and captains and et cetera. And so lead crew was always the target. It was the first one out and the, in the formation. And the fighters would, like, would, knew that the commanders were on there. And if they could break up a formation, if the German fighters could break up a formation, then they could have a ball. As long as we were all flying tight together, very tight, we would wave to the kid next door, you know, and uh, we stayed tight. That's why that co-pilot was in the tail. He wanted to make sure that everybody behind us was doing the same thing. And uh, and you flew in, so you flew 12, 12, and 12, three lead crews each mission. On our first mission, they shot down one of the lead crews. Uh, happened to be, and in the 12 12 12 deal, the low, low squadron, the low 12, were always the target for the fighters because they could come up underneath. They didn't have the protection of the rest of the guns in the formation. So that was, that was the way we flew in formation. Of course, the, fight, the fighter, our fighter escorts would come out from Belgium or someplace, France, pick us up. We formed over England. And that was a very dangerous thing. To, we took off single file and went up and had to form into the 12. Then we had to form the 12 into 36. And then we joined the bomber formation, headed out over the North Sea. And that took us right into Holland. Well, that's where the Germans had their big fighter bases. Meantime, the fighter pilots, P-51 to P-47, came up out of Belgium or France someplace, picked us up and escorted us all the way. And so one of my triumphs lately was that I found a, you know, a man who wrote his dad's diary, the P-51 fighter pilot dad's diary, and it's very complete. And it was a revelation to me the, the way they had to live and the way we lived. You know, we lived in England in Ponsard huts, and we had heat. Those fighter pilots lived in this a deep snow that year in tents and hid their fighters in barns and sheds or under canvas or camouflage, and they were right on the front. When they took off, they, the time they got off on a metal runway, of course, 
and they, they, they often be right in the combat zone. Now, their, their, their requirement was they spent 205, 225 hours, I believe, in combat, and then they were done. That was their tour of duty. Our tour of duty on bombers, by the time we got there, in late 44, our tour of duty had been raised from 25 missions to 35 missions. The Air Corps had improved, had picked up another third of their force by keeping us and keeping all the others. And suddenly, we, that's how we wiped out. That's how we just plastered Germany. And our job was after after uh, in the, during the Battle of Bulge after D Day, the Air Force was suddenly became tactical, and we hit all of the targets that would end the war. We hit bridges, railroads, uh, mar marshalling yards, they called them. We hit barges and highways, anything we could wipe out. Besides, we were always after oil and munitions, and but we weren't worried so much about troops. We were worried about stopping that war. And the fighter, the P-47 especially, became uh, dive bomber types, raking the railroads and everything and, and doing all that. And so we just stopped by the May of 45, of course, we completely stopped Hitler's ability to have war. And so that's why they tell stories about the guys, the Germans in the Battle of the Boats who walked tanks out of gas and everything, they just walked home. They just deserted, went on back home. And uh, those are some of the stories that come out as the war ended. Uh, we took the credit. The ground guys took the credit, and we took the credit. Everybody was credited for stopping the war statistically. We just froze them. And a lot, a lot, of, death, a lot of death and accidents and crashes and you know, assembly in Old England was as dangerous as anything because they kept crashing into each other and falling down into England. That's what I was going to ask. Is so? Is that one of the most dangerous aspects? Is the actually getting into formation? These great big lumbering bombers trying to get into a formation and not hitting each other. Yeah, that was everybody had. Everybody was assigned a certain height. And they had a certain flair to to assemble on, and then the other. When they assembled their 12, then they had another another flare in that center to assemble on. It was all it was all very complicated and it was all very dangerous, you know. We would have, some would have, some would assemble out over the North Sea that spread out over England. But there were if you read the statistics someplace, they will tell you how many people, how many plane crashes there were. I was in a collision, in a training collision. The other side of the war is when they trained you in the States and they sent you over, we went over on the Queen Mary. We we didn't even get to fly over. But the planes <laughs> were already there, so we went over to Queen Mary. But the we didn't know how to fly formation. We didn't hadn't practiced this real tight formation. I mean, we were close together. We winged almost winged up sometimes. And uh, about a thousand feet between each each twelve. But never, we took up about a cubic mile all the time. And uh, so the new guys came in, and the old guys were just about to finish, didn't want anything to do with us. So they took all the front positions, and the rookies had to train. We had to take training. And then we could fly with them by missions. And then after a while, here come some more guys. And we had to train them. And that's when I was in the air mid-air collision. We were training a bunch of guys that really didn't know how to fly B-17s in formation. And one of, them, one of them just, I was in the top, so I looked down and saw the mid-air collision. One, one just came up under the other one. And the plane started breaking up. And I've got stories on those two. And they, one guy said he just stepped out. We had a, had a little major, small guy. He'd been in three mid-air collisions in these training flights. Hmm. And then we got mid-air collisions on during missions. There was a terrible mid-air collision with one of our crews that we had trained with. 
and it, it's a like I say, it just gets so complicated that it's hard to to explain. And you guys have been studying or thinking about it. And I sit and try to sell books to people who don't know beans from apple butter, but they are very patriotic here in Midwest in Midwest U.S. And they they are interested in these books. I sold them. Three hundred and small, three hundred and twenty dollars, three hundred and forty dollars, seventeen, seventeen books, I think. And uh, yesterday, and uh, they let me sit in Walmart. I'm a character. I do this. I wear a leather jacket. I'm a character. I created <laughs> the last twenty three years. I did it on purpose. Uh -huh. I'm a teacher, and I wanted to keep on teaching, and so I educate the general public and now you know i sit there and some buy and some don't they all but they all know me because i've been sitting there for two three months <laughs> on weekends and so it just went in. i don't know am i answering your questions or am i just rattling on <laughs> you, you're answering my questions before i ask them yeah. <laughs> you've got some type of psychic ability james I do, I, um, I do have a quick can I can I ask a quick quick question, James. So you, you trained as a radio operator. Yes. Uh, and a gunner as well. So yes. what was what was the nature of the communications? You know, because obviously you have the navigator that would have had to oh. like form these formations and pick the path. But what, what was the nature of your communication with other aircraft it? or was it with Base or what was being a lead crew? I had to be on the radio and monitor it all the time because right. I would send messages from the. They might send messages from the base. They might change the target. Oh, Morse code was the only communication we had that distance. Now, if we'd had cell phone, I wouldn't have had a job. Mm. But you see, so we had Morse code and we sent the Morse code and the. Here I'm on the Memphis Bell. I got on the Memphis Bell. No, that's not the Memphis Bell. I, I take a lot of flights on old planes. And I do a lot of publicity on Facebook. I try. My goal is to tell people about World War II. And I just do this. There's no money in it. I mean, I lose money every day. You pay 800 to publish a book. They sell it back to you for $10. And you go out and try to sell it for 20 So it's a very expensive hobby. I got off track again. Oh, Morse <laughs> code is, uh, they. I sent what they told me to send, mm. but I had to listen for the base. I had to monitor the base, all, monitor the radio all the time in case the base would send messages. The base so sometimes it, change your target. So you would get a target change when you're actually on a mission. You're on a flight You path, could. Yeah, you could and, get that. Yeah. Because well, we had... We had reconnaissance planes checking on clouds and et cetera. Mm. And uh, if it got too bad at one place, they just change it to another. And, uh, and but we after, but we had that PFF radar that could see right through the clouds mm. once we made a lead crew. And then we had an operator sitting across the aisle from me. My position was behind the bomb bay. One of my jobs was to open the door and make sure all the bombs had left the plane. <laughs> But I sat on the left side of it behind the bomb bay. He sat on the right side, the, the PFF operator. The, we called it the Mickey, the Mickey Mouse. But it had an antenna like two big ears. And um, it would, he could sit there at, that, at his desk, see through the clouds, and guide the navigator right to the place he wanted to. So he was an assistant to the navigator. Right. And we got right. And we bombed targets we couldn't even see, but he had he had placed us where we were supposed to be, and uh, it was a very effective thing. We only had about each bomb group had about twelve of those planes, and so uh, the the uh, or maybe fifteen. But every time you flew a mission, three of them had to go with each squadron, one one with each squadron. And so we never had a plane that was ours. We never, we never had a plane that we could just paint a mission, paint an naked woman on, you know. We flew whatever they assigned us to fly. <laughs> and first four missions, I'm going to backtrack. When you're a green, they put you in the back of the formation. 
and they give you the old beat up planes. Now, my very first mission was to Berlin on December the 5th. I just celebrated my 79th anniversary. (laughs) And uh, they gave us an old plane. They put us back in the very tail of of the low squadron. So we were in the most dangerous place with a plane that was had done way too many missions. And we were and we were headed for Berlin, which hadn't been bombed in months. And but that's where they took us because the veterans wanted up front were a little bit safer. Turned out that the it was an easy job. Yes. <laughs> but it was, Berlin must have been the most deadliest mission right because it's the furthest it's in east germany it's the longest journey i mean it must have been a treacherous uh journey all the way how far could the fighters accompany you they would take off in well our, by the time we got there the fighters could go all the way oh really they could go all the way to Berlin. now you know you know in the early war that's why we lost so many planes yeah. those guys had, those guys had had the fighters would turn back and they the bombers had to fight their way to the target, mm. drop the bombs, fight their way back, and then our fighters would re- refuel and come back up. But meantime, the German fighters had a ball, you know. So that's that was that angle on that one. So by the time I got there in December of 44, or November of 44, we trained for, we took the training and we learned to fly lead, et cetera. And, uh, December the 5th was our first one, and then worst plane or Newark tail. Well, to finish the story, one of the motors started conking out, and we started drifting back. Now, if there had been any fighters in the territory, that would have been my first and last mission. But we gained our engineer uh, and the pilot, et cetera, knew what to do, and shift. you had to shift from one tank to the other. And there were different ways to do that. And then jiggle and I don't know, but they did it, and we made it. it we were falling back, and suddenly that that motor began to work again, and we pulled back in slowly but surely, and got back into our tail end Charlie position, which is still dangerous. But uh, but when we made that one, our our crew was very smart. That guy in the middle, that guy in the back, is was well, the pilot. He was a lawyer. And the guy on his right was a co-pilot, little, the little guy. He was a co-pilot. The guy on the left was a navigator. Well, the co-pilot became a medic, a doctor. The pilot became a lawyer of Kentucky Supreme, or Connecticut Supreme Court. And the navigator was an architect already. Hmm. And the guy, the gunners all had very lucrative positions when they came back. I was a school teacher. I'm the guy with a silly smile on my face and the ring on my finger. And <laughs> uh, but um, it was it, it was a double edged thing. It, you couldn't blame the veterans for wanting to finish and go home, but they always put us in the back, and we had to work our way forward. And the very fact that that pilot was such a hot pilot, we made lead crew in four missions. So uh, that, that that's how I saved saved my life too. And then flying lead crew, you didn't fly every blessed mission. You had to um, test the equipment, test the plane, fly over England, test Scotland, testing that plane before you went on another mission. So they'd pick out a plane, have the radar ready, and then they'd say, "You got to go up there and test it." So instead of flying a mission, we'd be up over Scotland someplace. Probably saved my life. Some of those, one of the faults of the Air, Air Corps was the fact that they made too many guys fly too many missions in a row. And uh-huh. I think fatigue, just human fatigue, t- took a heavy toll and a mistake. Right. And then if they were flying 35 missions, maybe two or three a day, they get funny. They be fin- they, some of those guys, my buddies and other crews, were, f- were finished or dead. They were finished and gone home or had died, and we were still stuck there because mm-hmm. we were flying every third mission or so. Mm-hmm. So that's another that's another look at it, another view of it, and uh, it, it was uh, it was something that you 
every mission you ate you ate breakfast with a bunch of guys and you wondered if they'd be there for supper mm. and it was that type of thing and sometimes they weren't but we always had flak holes we always flew into flak over the tires you, you i sat on the radio i monitored it I had to make position reports as we went toward, toward the target. The base wanted to know how far we had gone, how far we were, how close we were. And so there were a couple of position reports that the navigator would tell me to send back to base. And then when we, once we started the bomb run, that was called the initial point. So once we hit the initial point, the bombardier or pilot would say, okay, send that and tell them we're starting. And then we had to start the bomb run. Bomb run and the bombardier and his bomb site actually took over control of the plane and it was maybe 20 minutes straight in at the target and you just look out in front of you and there was all that flak the sky was just black with exploding shells you had to fly into it drop your bombs and fly on out and then on the other side with a our fighters would be waiting to protect us, and the German fighters would be waiting, might be waiting to attack us. So <laughs> it was a circle. And then we'd fly, of course, we had to fly all the way back home, and then we had to make land. You couldn't go eat immediately. You had to go to debriefing and uh, tell what you thought you saw or what happened from your viewpoint, and then eat supper and get back to the barracks. You know, see, if you if they got you up at one o'clock or three o'clock, and you went to breakfast, you went for briefing, you went to your plane, you didn't take off till eight, you flew four or five hours, you came back, landed, went to debriefing, and back to eat, and back to your hut. Most of the day was gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Eighteen hours or sixteen hours, but those kids, some those other guys. Flew one day after the other, maybe two two days in a row or three days in a row, and uh, Lord, it was a terrible price to, to ask. Yeah. We were all young and, and had all the stamina we needed, you know. Yeah, we um, got a pass about every two or three weeks. We get to go into London and oh, relax, yeah. and have fun, you know. I hear you, uh, I hear you like fish and chips. Uh, we had fish and chips about every night. We had, <laughs> the Swan Pub was just up the road. See, they, they said we were stationed at I, but Brome, Brome was a little community within I. So between I and this, we had the Swan, and uh, we had an English boy who adopted us, and his mother did our washing and everything. And we'd, we'd send him up to the swan and get a bunch of fish and chips. Of course, they, the fish was wrapped in newspapers and sprinkled with vinegar, and, <laughs> and the chips were just potatoes soaked in vinegar, and they were just delicious. It's, they can't they can't come back. I found two or three British restaurants, one in Houston and and one in, uh, in Indianapolis, and they try to imitate it, but they without the newspaper, it just doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we just loved them. <laughs> hey Hutch, do you do you mind if I show a couple of pictures I took the other night at your place? No, I'll be fine. I, I don't want to interject, but when 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 he was telling the story about his cadet ring that he got because he thought I was going to be a pilot, I, I would love for him to tell a little bit about how he still has and wears this ring here. Oh, oh. right. Wow. Yeah, it's upside down there. But, yeah, but air cadet pick air cadet ring was that was. I had to buy it. I had to pay thirteen dollars for it. And of course, it's sterling silver, but I bought it out of a jewelry store. Two weeks before they flunked me out, <laughs> then it became my lucky ring. So I flew all my missions with it. Wow! And, uh, then when we came home, the government was paid for our way through college, the GI Bill. So I got married, and uh, I bought my wife a cheap wedding, but engagement ring and then a wedding ring and she kept saying where's your ring and i said we can't afford one we're living on 90 dollars a month so she said just wear this one they got you through the war so just wear that's your wedding ring <laughs> so i've worn it all my life 
<laughs> and it's in the it's in the pictures. If you see my hand, you'll see a ring. On it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. I haven't written that story yet. I need to. Have you um have you been back to England since, James? No. No, I'm just a country boy. You see, money is I grew up in the Great Depression and I've never had any money. I never will have any money unless I sell copyrights to my books, which I don't expect to do. But um, no, I never, I never had extra cash. I've always, I wanted to be a teacher. And one of the reasons I wanted to be a teacher was because I've been through the war and I've been saved. And so take life easy. And so I was going to be a teacher and have summers off to play golf and et cetera. And, uh, well, it didn't work that way. We had, I had to work every blessed summer at odd <laughs> jobs to, to, uh, I worked as a clerk in an auto parts store for 16 years. I was the oldest employee every summer and every weekend I worked, even though I was teaching. I so said, money is, and then they have reunions and things now and, <laughs> Gets into two or three thousand dollars, and I said, "Forget it." I've been to two reunions, and in both times, I got to see one of my former crew members of late in life, and uh, those are the two that I, I really enjoyed. I've been to the Eighth Air Force um, Museum. I've been to Dayton here and there, and etc. But mostly, I just stay here in Bedford. I don't. Uh, we traveled all over the world after we were retired. We traveled all over the nation. But I have no desire. I would love to have gone back to England, say, in 95 or 96, uh -huh. or before my heart attack. I would love to have gone. But there was no occasion that I heard about. And so now it's too late. It's uh, I don't travel well with medicines and kidneys and this and that and the heart. My heart attack in 2000, and I had six bypasses. Where do you live now, James? So 23 years, I've gone on that, on those bypasses. I've got a pacemaker. But uh, where, where do you live now, James? Pardon? Where do you live? I'm on the edge of town across from a high school that I helped build. I'm in Bedford, Indiana. Bedford, Indiana. Okay. I'm 75 miles South of Indianapolis. Okay. And 75 miles north of Louisville, Kentucky. I'm almost a straight line. Right. Because uh, Indiana, Indiana University is 20 miles away. But I spent my entire life right here in Lawrence County. Right. Because I'm going to be in Virginia soon. So I might have to come visit you and I will cook you fish and chips because I, I can cook fish and <laughs> chips pretty darn well, just so you know. <laughs> And I will bring an English. That newspaper. would be good. You can fly in the end. You can fly in the end and be down here in, in an hour and a half or two hours. Exactly. And I'll, I'll put it in the newspaper. Or Louisville. Proper, I, I don't like Louisville. Louisville. I like Indy Airport better. Right. I'm going to kill you fish and chips. That's going to be my mission. I'm very good at it. Bring me some fish and chips. And don't forget do, the newspaper. <laughs> do, you like, do you like the mushy peas as well? Did you ever have the mushy peas? Or did you never have that? No, oh, you know, oh, that's even better. I'll, br I'll bring some of those as well. <laughs> I'll bring some of those. And we uh, had, I'll tell you a story now. We had, um, we had a turret gunner on by the name of Joe Parrish. Um, and he, uh, he told a story about the first time he flew into Flack. Um, and he said a prayer and he said the prayer to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, get me the F out of here. And there was a pause and he heard a voice in his ear and it said, Joe, next time you say a prayer, make sure your microphone's off. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> he had great comic timing, man. <laughs> I'm wondering, do you, do you remember the first time you flew into Flack, what that was like? Because we have no concept of what that would be like. The what now? Flying into Flack? Like, what, what is oh, that? Like? Well, the first time that yeah, happened. Well, they had prepped us on it enough, and we we had seen the doodle bugs coming over and hearing them explode here and there, and we had a few bombers come over. But the flak, we knew what it was going to be like. But 
down through the years of writing about it, I've learned so much more that I've been, I would really have been scared to death if I know what I know now. It's a little but, knowledge. <laughs> no, they, they, you know, they when they gave us a briefing, they showed us the map and showed us where the flak was. So we had to fly and avoid the flak guns. The ones on the railroads or the ones on the barges, we couldn't keep track of, of course. But once one exploded, you, it shook that plane, and you you could hear it hit the plane, and et cetera. And then, then you could see the sky full of it, and you get the heck out of there. And when you got to the target, there was no dodging. You were just you just flew into it. And one of the things we did for recreation was count the flak holes on the, in the plane when we got back. You know. <laughs> And you, I go, we got 50 today. And the other guy said, we got 70. And, guy said, and then some of them, if they really got shot up, they got the land first. We'd go over and look at the plane all shot up, you know. <laughs> but uh, it, it was a gamble. It was, it was, we had flak vests front and back, 45 pound flak, flak vest. We had a steel helmet. And if we could get hold of another flak, flak sheet, they had big sheets of, Woven metal covered with cloth, like a carpet, a rug, and we always wanted one of those to put under our chair <laughs> or wherever we were standing <laughs> to protect the family jewels, and that was always a joke, you know. But we had flak, we had flak sheets, but, but late in the war, and uh, at the time I got there, we had better protection, and we had the thing. It, <laughs> one of the things that drives me is. All these movies and things you see, the guy gets on the machine gun and he's and he just holds it down. You don't do that. You shoot the machine gun and bursts. You burn out the barrel if you shoot it. But the movies always make get it wrong, and they'll show this guy just shooting shell, 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 shell. He can't. He'll burn out rifles and the barrel, and it will be useless. So he shoots short bursts. That's one of the things I have seen that. In so many movies, you know, I don't care what fighter or whatever it is, you don't you don't just sit on it. Our co-pilot did it one day, and he burned out the barrels. <laughs> <laughs> he was back in the tail. <laughs> no, it's a uh, flak was just something you knew that you either were or weren't. Now, our waist gunner, we wore the steel helmet, and we had throat mics, so we didn't have to fool with that. And we had the oxygen mask, of course, so you just see this much of us. But our flag, our waist gunner, uh, he got hit on the 10th mission. We wear a steel helmet, just army helmet with flaps. Well, he got hit right above. They were, I think this was flak. And uh, of course, he's back at the waist. I didn't know what he was doing. You know, I didn't know anything except my little area. But he, they, you know, Robbie's been hit. And so he got hit just above the brim of the steel helmet. And we didn't know how bad it was. We knew he wasn't dead. So the other, other waste gunner and the engineer rushed back there and gave him some morphine, wrapped him up, and kept him warm with him. We, were, we had our heater, you know. We all had heated suits, and we had it, uh, access to the heat. And so he was, he was very calm. But he it did cut his eye, and he lost his eye, and and that was the day we landed in a snowstorm. Now we were flying in stupid weather that people wouldn't fly in, and uh, that winter because it was the worst winter Europe ever had, I think, as far as snow was concerned. And we when we were coming back with him wounded in the back in the waist, and everybody excited about it, what's happened, to how Robbie is, how Robbie is, and. Uh, as we come into our base, they warned us ahead of time on the radio. They said, snow's coming in, snow's coming in. Hurry, hurry. But we got there and we looked down and see the snow covering the base. Just covering the runway. Just like a magic blanket coming over there. So they said, get on to the next one. So we got on to another base. We landed with the wounded man. But luckily, it was at, they had a hospital at that base. Hmm. And so... They got him in the hospital and took care of him. The rest of us had to stay there for two days because our planes were locked into snow. No, we didn't stay there. We left him, and we had to get on trucks to go back to our base. Of course, everything was real close together, you know, 10, 20 miles. Bases are just 
like checkerboard everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, 40 of them and a couple of repair bases, as you can imagine, and all of England's RAF bomber bases. Mm -hmm. And you can just imagine what it was like. I mean, you're there, you know what it was like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, do you have, you flew 20 missions? Hey, what? You flew 20 missions. 20 missions, yeah. And about 400 hours of practice time, which anytime then, you're up in one of those stupid one of those bombers, you're in trouble. I mean, you you could be in trouble real fast. Is there one mission that stands out that you remember above all others? Now, that very first one. If, yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. Now, that Berlin mission. It was the worst. Now, the other one was at the very last, we were going all the way to Czechoslovakia. And the planes, the mission before us went into Czechoslovakia and they missed the target. And the stupid colonel running it, whoever he was, said, OK, we'll go around again. And that man took that formation out around the target and came in again. That gave the Germans time to get their jets off the ground. They sent three up and shot four of our planes just bang, bang, bang. And I got that that story. I got that story someplace. But the, but my best buddy who had been taken off our plane, the ball turret gunner, was on another plane that got shot down. The, the Germans captured him, took him in at night, interrogated him, and shot him at night. Just executed him, buried him in a pond, and they weren't found for a year. And that's all in one of the books about. I don't know what it was in. I was going to send you my first book and my last one, but I'm not sure that story is in the last one. But it's a dandy because I've corresponded with a son. I corresponded with a lot of guys who were, their fathers were in there. Yeah. And this guy's father was one of them executed with, Will, with my, my buddy. They executed eight of them, mm -hmm. threw them in the pond. And, the, and the, it was straw, pond, and manure, and it froze and it preserved the bodies. Mm -hmm. and more than you would think, you know. They, they're clear in all their flight clothes too. But that's a, that's that was, in Czechoslovakia. They have a ceremony every year at that at their grave site, uh, not grave site, but a headstone they put up to in remembrance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what What did the American bomber crews think of the Lancaster bomber, the British bomber, and the British crews? Did you ever come across any? I mean, the planes. One landed. One the landed seven, there one time. Was the B seventeen far superior in in its capabilities than a Lancaster was? A B seventeen was the best plane ever made, as far as I'm concerned. It, it would take a beating. It would take a beating, and it would keep going. Mm. You would shoot them to ribbons. And the Lancaster that I saw, I got to go on. He had trouble or something, and he landed there. But I thought it was primitive compared to the stuff on it, you know. Mm. The, the the belt was, the safety belt was thinner, or the, or the pedals were different, and this and that. And I just thought, well, I'm just glad I'm on that B-17. <laughs> and I just thought that it wasn't, it wasn't nearly, and it probably just a good plane, I don't know. Mm. But they always bombed, they bombed at night, which I admired them for, because that was, I got a German buddy here in town. He he came here and settled down and sent, he up, sent, sent seven of his kids to my school. So I got to know him real well. And uh, he was in Berlin when we were bombed. <laughs> Anytime that Berlin was bombed, he was there. So I got stories from him. It's just a character. And, uh, but the, he at the night, they would all run out in the streets and watch the British drop the bombs and then all the searchlights. And then the, the flak was... The aluminum sheets that they dropped to throw off the radar hmm. would fling it all down in those colored lights. So they call it the Christmas tree. And he was about eight years old. So he and his buddies would collect all his aluminum strips or about a square about like that. And uh, it, it deflected the German radar. Wow. What I was going to tell you is that when I, the other day I found out that that 
German shell, the 88, was about three foot high. Half of it was slug. But on the capsule, they could set our height and set it when to explode. Height and time. And if I'd have known that, I'd have been scared to death. <laughs> but they knew exactly. They get us the had radar on the on the eighty eight cannon, and they had this big shell. It took almost two men to load. It took a ten man crew to manage one. And uh, I mean, the Germans were well prepared. Well, we were just lucky to beat them. <laughs> well, yeah. we didn't beat ourselves. Everybody else beat them. Too. Are you um Are you looking forward to Masters of the Air coming out? Yeah, I thought it might be different. Yeah, yeah. I see so many. I see things that, you know, that take a lot of shortcuts. And they, don't, they don't allow for the human. So many times they don't allow for the human element in there, too. And the fact that you're scared to death and somebody's telling you what to do and you're trying to do it and trying to hear him. And, and uh, but see, we were just more or less isolated. The co pilot and pilot, of course, sat right together, but bombardier were down under him. Navigator back behind him a little bit. And then the top turret gunner, the engineer, the, the mechanic, they were all in front of the bomb bay. They knew what was going on all the time. But behind the bomb bay was my radio room and the later the radar operator's room. And then behind under that was the ball turret, which became and then behind that, the two waste gunners. And way back in the day of all themselves with that poor little tail gunner. And uh, it was, it was, a, we never knew what was going on. <laughs> when we landed, the engineer would tell us what happened. We didn't, even, we didn't know half the time who the command pilots were. Major so and so would get on, or Colonel so and so. So, <laughs> but, but, I was, was the base commander, and we didn't know it. So was the plane kind of, did the plane, did the crew kind of split? You had the before bomb doors part of the crew and the aft bomb doors part of the crew. Did they kind of mix more socially? No, like no, but no, we were all, our, our pilot was very smart and he, he included he included the enlisted men and everything he could do. He, okay. if he could include us, he knew what he, he knew his life depended on us. Right. He was smart enough to realize it. Now, there were some smart aleck pilots that treated their crew badly. Mm. And uh, horses' tails, we call them. Only worse than that. A little yeah. lower. Was the word but, definitely uh, tail, James? I'm not sure. See, our crew, we had, I, I told you, that crew was just, we were very, we were cohesive. And everything we did was for the good of the crew. Nobody drank. And we wouldn't let a drunk around us. And... Uh, Everybody was in perfect shape, and we, anytime we flew a mission, if somebody was sick, he stayed down. Nobody wanted to stay down because they wanted to finish with their crew. Right. It was bad luck to miss a mission. The tail gunner, they took off my plane. I've talked to his sons, his daughter and his son, and they tell me that he flew 35 missions. He was 18. He flew 35 missions. 18 and 19, he threw 35 missions. And he told them, he didn't talk about his missions much, but he told them one time, he said, I was sick three times. And every time I was sick, the guy that took my place got killed. Wow. So that's why he believed in God. Mm. It was okay. just that, those things like that. Mm. But so, I, I flew lots of times. Several times I flew with a real bad cold and I'd just scream and carry it. I go up and down altitudes. I'd just scream and pound the desk and endure it because I didn't want to miss it. I wanted to finish with that crew. That was part of your luck. Um, Bob. So we'll we'll probably round out now because we've we've had James for an hour. I just wonder if there's anything else you wanted to add that you've you've learned from uh, Hutch here. Well, you know. I have a couple of pictures that I took, something very interesting, you know, Hutch being a writer now for the last how many dozen years and writing all these books. Um, he was, he's also quite the artist in that. Oh, okay. That was so during his time in the war. So 
I want to uh, just share a couple of pictures here because I think it's it's just fantastic. It really speaks to. Yeah, that uh, was a way to pass the time. That's yeah. Cool. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. It's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I, lo I, I love these. Like, you know, little dates in there. I mean, you know, yeah, I was sitting on a foot locker. That was a. That was our storage cabinet at the Foot Locker. Everybody had a Foot Locker. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you had—a Foot Locker and a place to hang your coats. <laughs> so wow. cool! I love this one here with the the stove. Hmm. Oh yes. Yeah. So uh, this will be very relevant to our listeners because what's going to happen is we're going to put up a link to all of um, Hutch's James's books. Uh, on our website and so for the, yeah good uh, yeah yeah james coming good as me of course we are um but they there's a the stove plays a central role in the lives of these men and you'll 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 read about it when you get when you delve in just quite how i may send you so yeah please do quite i may send you a different picture of, of all the books i think we're short one there okay, okay. But we'll we'll put a link up as well, James, so that so yeah, people just, can, can choose and where to get in everything, and how important the stove is, and who sits who camps near the stove, and it's it's a whole thing. It's it's quite fascinating. Well, listen, guys, I've had everybody for an hour. Um, I'm going to round out now and say thank you very much, James. Thank you so much for coming I on. Might, I might tell you, my uh, my computer is acting up, so I don't. That's the reason I didn't say anything, didn't acknowledge anything today. I'm trying to keep it hold so I can get somebody in here to fix it. So <laughs> I can't receive the email okay. for some unknown reason. Okay. But it'll all be fixed in three or four days. Good. You are. Uh, I can you... send you anything you want. I can I can send you. But there's one picture I didn't show you that, that I like. It's when I came home, I well, of course, the first thing you did when you came home was get into civilian clothes. But so one day I hung, I had my tech sergeant shirt and my tie and everything on hanging on a chair, and I drew it in color in chalk. And it's sort of symbolic of the war is over, I'm home. You know, it's mm -hmm. not so I'll send you some of that stuff and you can yeah, I'd love use to your that. judgment of what you want. Yes, uh, please. But, You'd probably See, be the most. The thing that I do now, I won't bother to send you. I'll just send you the war stuff that I do, that yeah. I did in my sketchbook. You'd uh, you'd probably be the most erudite seventy-year-old I've ever interviewed. So the fact that you're the most erudite ninety-eight-year-old is <laughs> incredible. You are. Uh, Wait a minute! No, ninety-eight point six. Ninety-eight point six. You got to count every day. <laughs> Well, listen, man, it's been beautiful having you oh, on. Thank you so me, much. Boy, I'm, 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 I'm hanging in there. Yeah, hang in there. It's been an honor having you on, James. It's been thank, an thank you very you much. Bob. Thanks, Bob. I really, I've been, I've been enjoying you again, it. Bob. A great one. Thank you so much. Take yeah, care, sir. guys. How much? All right. <laughs> no.